Thank you, Mark. And thank you, everyone here. Hmm. Thank you for having me. So today, I'm going to share some stories. I'm going to read a little bit from my book. And I'm going to offer some ideas as to about what endings mean to me. But more importantly, what endings mean or could mean for you. I'm a memoirist or personal essayist, and what I love about that genre is that I read it versus, I read it all the time. And I, uh, so for example, I read, I loved the book, the memoir uh, Wild, uh, Lost and Found on the Pacific Crest Trail. I see a few nodding there. And uh, what I loved about it was that I followed its journey, its intensity with such passion, but I would never want to do that hike. I also would never want to do the gross grind. I'm not a hiker, and yet the entire book is about hiking. And what I love about it is I took it the way I wanted to go. I took it to my own journey, my own application to my life. So I invite you to listen to these ideas and take them where you want to go. I don't want you to care about me. I want you to care about you. <laughs> How does this sound? Okay. So now I hope you don't mind. <clears throat> but I'm going to rely a little bit on notes here. You see, since having a baby two years ago, I feel like my brain is entirely reconstructing itself to rule the world, <laughs> okay? Um, but sometimes it makes me have to do things like rely on notes, otherwise I take millions of tangents and I can't find my way back. Um, especially because my son woke up, my two-year-old woke up four times um, last night, crying, poor little guy, um, and finally up for the day at 5.15. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for your patience and empathy. With that said, what do you do with an ending? When we think of endings, we tend to think of the difficult, the devastating, the conflictual, the bittersweet, the anxiety-ridden moments in our lives, the end of a job, the end of a relationship, or the end of a life. Yes, endings can be horrible, wrought with conflict and despair and even hopelessness. Whether we expected the end or not, we can dread them, avoid them, get mad at them, or be reluctant to engage. And rightfully so. So what informs my understanding of endings? Death. When I was 11 years old, a young man high on a number of substances broke into my family's home in the middle of the night. He picked up a knife in the kitchen and went wandering around trying to find something to steal. He went towards the noise instead of away. When my father awoke and confronted him, this man stabbed him a number of times, ran away, and my father died in the emergency room in the hospital where he was, becoming, uh, he was training to become an orthopedic surgeon, surrounded by his family and friends. My dad liked to make things. He liked to build things. He liked to go on adventures. That night, my world was shattered. I felt everything ended. My dad's life ended. Our family's way of interacting and being together ended. Our wellness ended. And soon after, we moved back to Vancouver to be close to family and friends, but I felt that I lost my entire community too. And we all had to create new lives. So what do you do with an ending like that? Well, if pop psychology over the past 100 years had anything to say about that ending, we'd continue to think of death and endings as something we have to work through. We'd be encouraged to say goodbye to the person who died, accept our new reality, sever the relationship, move on, and let go, all within a relatively short period of time. In fact, this is often what informs our narrative around death, and what often informs our narrative around endings is what our ideas and theories of death. It's funny how that happens. On the one hand, these ideas and theories give us a voice to very intense experiences. And on the other, I feel they severely restrict and limit our experience of what can be experienced. Now, I've allowed this kind of critical lens of questioning these ideas to inform my entire professional career. 
So yes, I'm an author, and yes, I'm a teacher now, uh, but I was a youth worker before, um, and I've occupied several roles. In fact, what brings me to this community or what makes me feel that the room is full of love and ideas is that I feel like I'm a designer in the helping field. <laughs> I feel like I help my students design environments, design uh, families to be able to help everyone thrive, which is just what all you architects and illustrators and all of you do. Um, I get to stand up in front of that classroom with people who want to work with young people, and we get to question everything that we're told. In fact, if we were to actually listen to young people and their lived experience of when someone significant in their life dies, we'd see them create. They'll often try to create a relationship with the person who has died. They'll create, they'll try to connect. They'll create ritual and ceremony where none exists. They'll try to identify something that sustains their own wellness and the, uh, the essence of what, was, what their relationship was about with the dead person. And perhaps you have done this too. I'm seeing a few nodding. And I love hearing those stories of like, what did you do to create that person back into your life after that person died or after that relationship ended? So in many cases, young people will do this in secret because that they know that the very well-intentioned helpers and adults in their lives will actually try and push them to let go and move on. Or worse, uh, or like so many things, we often forget our capacity to do that. Or worse, it's been silenced or shamed in some kind of way. There's also research over the past number of decades that hasn't entirely entered into mainstream kind of pop culture Things that you may have heard before, something like post-traumatic growth. Here we see people describing life after significant loss, death, and trauma, their ends, with more capacity to care for others, a deepened appreciation for life, personal strength, and an expanded spirituality. So I believe this is actually creativity at work. So... I think creativity causes us to literally reconstruct our lives during and after endings. I think ending can be about renewal, about appreciation, about hope and growth and life. They can be both horrible and they can be beautiful. When we narrate our grief, for example, as an expression of love, we actually develop much better ways to work, move, move through that grief and live with it. So as you are no doubt thinking perhaps of some endings of your own, I'll ask you this. How did this ending tell you what you needed? How did attending to that end give you what you needed? So what did I do with my ending, you may be asking? In and amongst the difficulty, I created. I created a relationship with my dad. So for example, school is extremely important in my family, like very, very important. And I would take my report cards down to Larson Bay. Has anyone been to Larson Bay before? It's over on the North Shore. It's just kind of across English Bay. It's a beautiful beach. All the public signage has been taken down because I think the locals just want it for themselves. So like go, go and disrupt that. This beautiful beach, go at sunset, it's stunning. It's where we go to remember and celebrate my dad and where we scattered his ashes many years ago. I used to go there and I'd show him my report card. What a silly thing to do and also so lovely. I also began writing to him. I didn't know I was intending to do this. I just opened up a journal and began writing to him and didn't stop. I would tell him about my day, I would ask him questions, I would complain about a lot, and I would even say, look away, Dad, I'm about to write about a crush on a boy. <laughs> I literally tried to create a relationship with him after his death. But this ending in my life didn't stop taking shape. It surprises me and continues surprise, to surprise me in many ways, as it will continue to do. Twenty years later, I sat across from a new friend at a coffee shop. And like all new friends, I eventually tell them how my dad died. 
and I tell them a very similar story as to what I told you today. And most people are shocked and horrified, rightfully so. But she was the first person out of all the people I had told before who curiously asked me, do you know anything about the offender? And at that exact moment in time, I thought, I want to know more, and I need to know more. I wanted to address that part of my end. And so what came after was two years of correspondence and eventually meeting with the offender in prison. That story is what I write about in my book, <clears throat> Dead Reckoning, How I Came to Meet the Man Who Murdered My Father. In fact, I in part wrote this book because at the end of this journey in my life in 2013, people asked me, how did it go? And I didn't know how to answer within the couple minutes we had left at the dinner table or on the car ride home or on the walk wherever on the seawall. I just didn't know what to do. And so this is the form that it took. And I'm not surprised given my kind of writing tendencies. So I'm going to read to you the book's prologue and which actually starts, um, uh, it starts the book, obviously, uh, but it actually is at the, closer to the end of the actual story. <clears throat> Drumheller, Alberta, is a dry and underwhelming place. It's rolling beige hills scattered with farmland, water towers, and bales of hay put me in a reflective mood. Drumheller is known for two things, I'm guessing. One is the Royal Tyrell Museum of Paleontology, located in the Badlands where dinosaurs roamed millions of years ago. When I was a little girl, I visited it, as do 400,000 others do each year. More recently, I visited Drumheller's lesser-known institution, its prison. Situated just a few minutes' drive out of town, on Institution Road, no less. Medium security grounds looked as I had expected. An image formed in my mind from watching too many episodes of CSI and Law and Order. Massive gray block buildings with a towering chain fence perimeter. The minimum security grounds, however, surprised me given their lack of fencing and permanent buildings. One story residential and, administra and administrative portable structures and a large greenhouse were scattered about the open space. In front of the administrative building, child sized plastic patio chairs sitting in the garden space, and encircled by a low rise, white painted chain link fence, caught my attention. That's for family visits, my guides, Jennifer and Dave, informed me as we parked in the gravel lot. Jennifer, who I guess was in her late 30s, was dressed plainly and exuded patient warmth. She sat still, calmly, without taking on the gravity of the situation. While I had met her formally only 12 hours earlier, she already knew me well. A restorative justice practitioner, she had read and delivered the letters between me and the man I was about to meet. She always left kind notes on the fax cover pages that accompanied his letters. Just wanted to check in to see how Karis is doing with all of this. Or, please let Karis know that he writes about the crime in this letter. So I knew she cared about me and was there to nurture the process I was about to embark on. Dave, perhaps in his late 50s, is a longtime leader in the field of restorative justice, and he had started walking me through the journey that had brought me here when I met him a year and a half ago, back home in Vancouver, British Columbia, 1,452 kilometers away. I expected the guards to be unwelcoming, so I was impressed that I could walk right through the entrance, sign in, and go straight to our room. There were no guards checking pockets or ID. This did not feel like a prison, not that I knew what that felt like. Jennifer and Dave had conducted these kinds of meetings before. Their combined experience eased the worries I had but did not know how to articulate. I had no precedent, no guidebooks, and no expectations. Really, there was no way to prepare myself for the moment the person who changed the course of my life when I was just 11 years old. The person who murdered my father would walk into the room. 
And all I could think about, waiting there at 8.30 in the morning, was where would the four of us sit? Instinctually, I chose the chair facing the door through which this man would enter. I would sit across from him, and the practitioners would sit between us, around the curved end of the boardroom table that took up too much of the room's space. I did not want to appear confrontational by sitting directly across from him, but the small yet yet significant constraint of the room's size and furniture was all a part of that day. I silently sat in the uncomfortable black office chair, affirming my decision to sit here, and not in one of the other 15 chairs surrounding the table. While Jennifer and Dave chatted as they set up the video recording equipment at the opposite end of the room. They came back to their newly assigned seats, and Jennifer informed me about what would transpire over the next 20 minutes of my life. Karis, when you're ready, Dave and I will exit the room, go to the guard station, and ask the guards to call him from his room. I watched her attentively. You'll hear his name being spoken over the intercom. Sometimes they'll say offender or inmate. This seemed odd to me. They really needed reminding of their status in prison? Jennifer noted my reaction and nodded in agreement. He'll come from his room to the guard station just outside this boardroom within a few minutes, and then I'll introduce him to Dave. And at that point, either Dave or I can come back to sit with you. And she said it like a question. In that moment, I knew the importance of having a woman sit next to me. Despite having just met Jennifer, I knew she knew me. She would help me to feel as comfortable as possible. And if I could be myself, I thought, that anything that might happen that day would be okay. And if something happened and I was okay, that would mean I was present. And that day, being present was my only hope for myself. You, I replied instinctually. So, I'll come back and sit with you, and after, da- after a few minutes, Dave will knock lightly on the door and see if you're ready to have them both come in. If you're not, that's okay. He'll go back and wait. Okay. At any point, we can take a break. You just tell us what you need. People think they'll be stuck for what to say, but in our experience, the day can fill up quite quickly. We'll be here to guide you, but we know you and you'll be just fine. I smiled. If you want to end it, just say you're done. You'll know when you're done. You'll just know. She paused and then said, you just tell us when you're ready. I felt my body fill with intensity, acutely aware of the tingling in my legs, stomach, and arms. I couldn't speak. How could I tell if I was ready? I had been waiting a long time for this moment and could not believe it was here, waiting for me to be ready. I held my breath, and the pressure in my face rose. Tears started streaming down my face. How could I be ready to meet the man who had violently claimed my father's life? The man who had caused me to ask what was the point of life? What was the point of living? This man had brought pain into my joyful world, so much pain that it had become familiar. The joy in my life died alongside my father, put back together again anew, but never the same. Death invites people to live It occurred to me that I had a choice. I could leave. I had been intentionally engaging in this process and it had never occurred to me that I might not go through with it. I wondered if people traveled all this way, across lands, emotions, and social divides, and then turned back. Had others come this far and then turned around? I thought of all the people who were waiting by their phones in case I needed them. I thought of those who remained silent about my journey. What would they think? I was so tired of their presence in my mind, having to attend to their needs and their questions. And then I realized that none of these people, neither friends or family, had done anything like this before. They had no idea what to expect, what would happen, and how it would feel. It was just me here. There were no family and no friends, just me. I'm here for me, I thought. And with that, they all left my mind. Jennifer and Dave sat patiently next to me. I breathed in and I breathed out. I told myself I could do this. I would pay attention to what I needed to. I would say 
what I needed to. I would feel what I needed to. I would be myself. When embarking on this kind of journey of restoration, of accountability, and peace, taking a leap of faith seems necessary. So I raised my head to look into Jennifer's eyes, straightened my back, and wiped the tears off my face and announced, I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you. So I did meet with him and we spoke the entire day. It was frustrating, it was enlightening, it was confusing, calm, emotional, and deeply satisfying. We left the prison at the end of that day and drove from Drumheller back to the airport in Calgary. As I stared out the car passenger's window, I had an overwhelmingly powerful and calm experience. I'll backtrack a little bit. You see, when my father was murdered, an unease entered into my life and that I carried around with me most of the time, not even knowing it. A subtle unease and it told me, you never get to feel safe, you never get to relax, and you never get to feel love and joy again. As I stared out that window into the rolling hills and fields in Alberta, I thought to myself, I just met my father's murderer, and I am okay. And if I can meet my father's murderer, and I'm okay, then I can do anything. And I have never felt that unease again. In fact, after I ended correspondence with him a little while later, I created a ceremony to mark that ending. I didn't want it to just end with me sending a letter to my restorative justice workers through email. How vague to just press send and this entire experience be done. I'm a fan of marking difficult endings with, in a celebratory way. I think I was taught this when we had a celebration of my dad's life instead of a funeral. So I took all of those letters, all 15 of them, and went to Larson Bay, the place where we go to remember my dad and where we scattered his ashes a number of years ago. And I sat on the rocks on a very sunny May afternoon day and read each letter aloud. And as I read them, I tore each one into pieces and scattered them into the Salish Sea. They swirled and swirled and swirled around in the ocean's current, and then they disappeared. And not too long after, much to my surprise, and continuously since then, a joy has re-entered my life in ways that I could not have fathomed. So in the middle of the reading that I just read to you, I said, death invites people to live. I overheard my brilliant stepbrother saying something along those lines, I think my deputy dad, that's what I call my stepdad, deputy dad, was writing a eulogy for a funeral or something like that. And in conversation, my brother just happened to say, death is about the living. And I thought about those words over and over and over again. And I truly believe that, that death is about the living, just as endings, I believe, are about beginnings. Death invites people to live, and endings invite people to begin again. Begin again with the hard-won knowledge that you've just gained through this horrific, difficult, bittersweet, or conflictual ending. You know, I just wrote a manuscript for a textbook. You, you will never read it, so. <laughs> for a textbook to help child and youth care students go out on practicum or internship. One of the, chapter, one of the chapters is on ending their time at practicum. So I have to do a literature review on this, right? There's like hardly any information because hardly ever do we explore endings. The literature says now that we need to do three essential things and I think those three essential things can be applied in many other contexts. One, honor the essence of the relationship and the time spent together. Two, leave an object behind to remember. And three, have some kind of celebration that makes us look forward to the future. I am so glad that the literature is catching up to what young people already know how to do. 
So I leave you with this. What will you do with your end? How will you begin again? What will you create? How will you take your difficult, horrible, bittersweet, or conflictual ending and make it beautiful? Thank you. Do you want to, everybody, let's do a, a thing. If I hand you the mic, could you stand and just say your first name so we all can just get a sense of who you are? Hi, I'm Elaine. Hi, Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering if your ending with your book changed your relationship you had formed with your father. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Um, wow, what a lovely question. I have never, I do a lot of readings and speaking things at various different groups and I have never received that question and I feel like I'm so honored to receive it because yes, it did. So, and I'll try and um, explain that through a story. So, um, I, in doing this journey and then writing about the journey, I was like tasked with this big challenge of like, well, how do I share this stuff that's been going largely just in my head um, and kind of just around me? But like, I, I think I live a pretty like boring life. So like, how do I make that interesting? How do I take these thoughts and why I've done this journey, et cetera, and share it in a book form to keep you engaged the entire time with something that you may not actually agree with, right? They may think this is absurd. I would never do something like that. I'm like, still, I have to attend to your needs. Anyways, so I was like, how do I do that? And so as I worked through those writerly problems, right, or, or things, um, and I told this story and it ends, I, I, I break your heart in the story and then I promise to put it back together again. And by doing that, I realized I am more like my father than I never, like I never realized. Um, I'm, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I, um, I don't build houses and violins and uh, flying foxes and I never will for my son. I will buy those things for him when he asks me. Um, uh, but I, I am just, I'm like him, my personality, my desire, to try new things all the time and then kind of drop most of them but keep the loved ones I love and just keep doing that and I didn't realize that like I didn't I didn't have a clue um, I thought I was like him in a number of ways I have a similar profile to him I you know there's some things but by writing by doing it and then by writing about it and having to put it in words and in story-like form I became closer to him and I was like whoa what a gift like how lovely so yeah so thanks yeah. <laughs> I have a question that I, I suspe suspect others might have for you. Um, actually, I have a question for the audience. How many of you, as you listened to that, had deep recollections of death and, and maybe traumatic sort of moments like that in your life? How many of you have experienced or been a part of um, restorative justice? Three of us, four of us. Could you tell us a little bit about the relationship? What is restorative justice? How did you get to there and what does it mean? Sure, yeah. No, I'd love to. And um, I should preface that with, like, I'm a recipient of restorative justice, right? Like this service. I don't work in that field. I'm, like, closely aligned with that field. I teach in child and youth care and uh, youth justice even. Um, but I've never been, like, a restorative justice worker, the people who I describe in the book as my guides. Anyway, so I say that as a recipient. And so... Um, restorative justice exists in a number of forms today. Um, it's a very, very old idea. Um, comes from indigenous and uh, Mennonite and other communities. Um, Restorative justice is about repairing harm done to communities um, through crime or harm. Um, and uh, what that repair looks like is entirely different based on what those needs are. So unlike the criminal justice system, which today, based on hundreds of years as it's developed, um, is based on uh, like punitive uh, ideas and rehabilitation through a very restricted lens, right? Like, so we know, all know that. We're all in, in some sort of relationship to the criminal justice system, whether we work for it, or whether we've been impacted by it, etc. cetera. Um, anyways, restorative justice is its kind of like counterpart, and the two can co exist together. Uh, that's one big, huge myth that um, it seems to be kind of prevalent right now as we talk about restorative justice in the news media, in kind of pop culture as it enters mainstream conversation. Um, it has some myths. Um, it can be anywhere from 
preventative practice, like, practices like circles and schools, which is like every community, uh, North Shore, Surrey, like there's so many great places or even just in the Lower Mainland that do, do, do like restorative justice um, uh, within circles and schools and kind of teaching people re re um, reparative and conflict uh, negotiation and mediation kind of skills to kids so that they like live with that and bring it into their future communities. And then there's also kind of like a diversion type of program. So you might might hear about a diversion program, um, uh, like a partnership between the RCMP and the, um, and the restorative justice program that's linked to schools, etc., where a, per a young person may be uh, charged with petty theft or vandalism or of some kind. And instead of sending them through the criminal justice system, they divert them and go through a restorative justice system where there's um, things like, you know, uh, you know, community work and, and circles where, we, um, where there's discussion between the person who's harmed and the person who's done that harm. And then there's all the way on the other side of the spectrum, or like along the spectrum rather, uh, where I might like probably on some form that the restorative justice workers had to fill out when I contacted them, and in this side, um, where <clears throat> like horrendous violent crimes, sexual assault, like the horrific violent crimes, um, where restorative justice exists too. Now, it doesn't exist in the way of like diversion programs, although that's kind of sometimes a misconception when, um, you know, news media might have two minutes to quote someone on something. And I've literally heard in the past couple of years someone saying, well, restorative justice doesn't work for murder. And what they really mean is we're not going to divert someone um, from the criminal justice system in that way at present. <laughs> Anyways, and so what I was involved in was something officially called a victim-offender dialogue. Um, that's what I was doing the whole time I corresponded with the offender, but at every point in time, I had a choice. So I was given choices, I, you know, one of the chapters is about all those choices I was given, and I'm a letter writing kind of, I come from a letter writing family, and so I, I'm not surprised that I chose letters, because that was safe, it was uh, paced, etc. and then eventually wanted to meet him. In fact, they said, you can, like, we're ready to send you now, and I'm like, I'm not ready. And so we waited quite a while until I was ready, and then said, now I wanna meet him. And so they give you, much more choice. They are often in restorative justice programs now, they have a victim-centered model, meaning they prioritize or center uh, the victim. I'm a registered victim, according to the government of Canada. Um, and literally, I'm a registered victim, and I receive uh, letters in that. Anyways, I could talk about that forever, but I won't. So, um, and, uh, and so uh, my needs are centered in this uh, conversation. Not, not, nothing's perfect, uh, but uh, my needs are centered, and that was everything. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Hi, I'm Robin. Hi. Um, my question is, is, do you have, does your son have a relationship with your father, and how do you go about doing that? Oh, thank you. Oh my gosh, you guys are brilliant. Okay, so I, lo hey, oh, I love this This is question. the Creative Mornings crowd. I know, I was like... Top drawer. I know, I was like, Mark, this is, I totally want to come. When he gave me, he was like, well, these are some of the themes that we're exploring. And he, he I think he said a couple and then the end was there and I was like, oh yeah, that one. That's, that's the one that I should come to. Anyways, um, anyways and so to your question, uh, yeah, so... Um, you know, in the kind of talk, I said, you know, how does this morph and shape over time? How does this end uh, exist over time? And that is the exact way that it end, that that um, I am now tasked, for better and for worse, to figure out how do I create a relationship with um, between my son and my dad. And um, so I'll, I'll tell you a little story. Um, before my son was born, my nephew was born. Uh, and he was the f like the, the first nephew in all of my step siblings, uh, uh, all of our uh, kids. Uh, there's now six, anyways. So um, in like the past four years, and uh, so anyway, so he was born, and you know I was as he was growing, and I was babysitting, and once in a while, you know, like with all the free time I had with him before a kid, I was connect to him, and I would want to tell him stories, and we see a picture of my dad on the fridge, I'd be like, that's your grandpa Jeffrey. And, um, and he would smile because the photo was smiling and, you know, kids copy and it's adorable. But then I found it was, like, really awkward. I was like, I don't know how to bring up stories of my dad, even though I have 
lots of stories to bring up. Um, and I was really reliant on kind of my environment, right? Like the pitcher, or like, let's say I saw like a boat, I'd be like, oh, your grandpa Jeffrey used to sail, and we, we have a boat, it's called Tangerine, and, and whatever. And so, and, but I felt kind of awkward, and I didn't know how to do that. So I wrote, a bu I wrote him a book. Um, and so I, I wrote him a little children's book. It's called My Grandpa Jeffrey. Um, and I didn't really, and it was just, it was just for him. Uh, but then I thought, no, actually, it's for all the kids. And so I, I made copies, and now my son reads it. And, it's, and it says things like, uh, it's very picture-based, you know, my grandpa Jeffrey fixed bones. Because I was like, I'm not going to say orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> and um, delivered babies, because I'm not going to say family physician before that. Um, and he uh, built a cabin on a lake and a flying fox, because they'll know what that is, you know. And so lots of little pictures, and that he liked to smile, and that he loves you. And when there's a picture of him smiling, my son then smiles a big smile. When there's lots of pictures, I didn't realize that these pictures had a ton of my dad in ties. Like, I never noticed that. But my son points them out now, and he says he wants to wear his tie. And I'm like, how perfectly appropriate for an 18-month-old, two-year-old to do that, right? And smile at the end and get all giddy when I, says, but the mo when I say the most important thing is that my grandpa Jeffrey loves me. And so... Um, that's the way that uh, I'm a writer, <laughs> and so that's what I fell back on because I was like, what do I do with this awkward feeling that I'm having, but I feel this responsibility? And so, um, so I did that, and what will come next is all their questions. Who's Grandpa Jeffrey? How did he die? These are the big questions that we are, like my family is tasked with, the emotional labor that I don't want to do. Like, I'd rather learn to figure out how to build a flying fox, but instead I have to spend a ton of time figuring out, right, how do you tell a four-year-old how Grandpa Jeffrey died without freaking him out, but without lying to him or keeping silent? And that's what we have to figure out what to do. Yeah. Okay. Any men with a question? We're, we're... <laughs> no, all women. Okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name's Mac. Hi, I Mac. have a unisex name and a deep voice, so it's <laughs> kind of towing the line there. Um, thank you so much for sharing. That was incredible. Thank you. Uh, this question might not go as deep as all the other ones. Sorry, Mark, not quite as top shelf. Um, but it's something I wonder about. I can be a little bit awkward about grief, and I just want to like plow through all the emotions and get over it and be done with it. Yeah. So when people are struggling with things, I don't always know what to say. Yeah. What? did people say to you that was actually helpful rather than just mm. a canned hallmark response? I'm so sorry for your loss. I care, but how do I tell them? That yeah. I do? Thank you. Oh, like, that, like that's a really important question. Now, I can only speak from my own experience. In no way do I speak for everyone. And the fact that you have people you care about, you know them, you love them, like exuding that essence is the way that you respond to them, right? As opposed to like picking up something to say from someone else. But with that disclaimer said, um, I'll give you some examples of what was not helpful <laughs> and contrast them with what was helpful. Um, things like uh, the world would only challenge you in ways that you can stand up to, things like that. Um, the... Um, it's not as bad as this situation over here. At least you knew him. You know, things like of that nature. Now we've all been told these various things, like when, when we're all feeling pain or harm or, or whatever, we've been told versions of that, I'm sure. Like, I, like I'm, I'm certain you could go back and think of those things. So those are things we want to stay away from. Um, I, and the things that really worked were just people who sat with me and said, like, this fucking sucks. Like, I see you, that you're struggling, and I know you can do this, and I'm here. Um, things that didn't, things that just totally avoided minimizing the situation. But also things that kind of brought me out of despair that weren't like, like, let's get out of despair, but more of like, like let's just go be silly <laughs> together. Like, let's just go um, and do something meaninglessly, carelessly enjoyable. Um, things of that, that only you as a friend or a close person would know um, what to do or could do, right? Um, and just stay away from those minimizing the um, 
silencing, shaming type of things. Um, the people in my, in my book, I actually gave a couple of examples from my youth, which is a very particular like developmental time. So like different needs as opposed to when you're older, et cetera. So um, people would say things like, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And like, as an adult, I know what that means. They're trying to convey empathy, sympathy, et cetera. But as a young person, like probably a bit rigid about language, I was like, you're sorry for, you feel pity about my life? Like, this is my life. Like, why, why would you feel that way? And so, like, I always try and think, like, well, how is the person, how may they perceive this? Um, counselors told me that, oh, well, you're going to be really mad at your dad for leaving you. I have never felt that in my life. But I sure did ask my mom if I could never see that counselor again. <laughs> um, and young people, I'm sure you have all done this, is you will, you will try and figure out a way to resist the thing that is shaming you or silencing you in some kind of way. We're not always successful. Um, anyways, but then there's also other like counselors and teachers and whatever who did the exact opposite. For example, one person, one uh, guidance counselor noticed I like to write. I must have been writing on like just loose leaf paper or whatever. And she gave me a journal, like, cool. She didn't say anything along with it, just like, Notice you like to write, and, um, and I have that. I still have that journal filled with like, oh, talking to my dad, right? Um, and other, uh, so I'll give you one last story and, and we can move on to another lovely question, uh, is that, um, you know, I was, I, was I, I ruminated, right? Like I obsessed, I ruminated, I thought about these ideas a lot because it impacted my entire life. And one teacher, um, so in school though, I was like highly accomplished, performed well, whatever. Um, I ran away from uh, home for two weeks and I still did my homework, like I'm that kind of, <laughs> like I'm that kind of person. Anyways, so, um, <laughs> and so once I was sitting in a high school classroom, uh, I think it was like career and personal planning, and I was looking at a photo of my dad. I had finished all the homework or like whatever activity was in class, and I was looking at a picture of my dad that I carried around with me in my backpack most days. And my teacher just kind of like was roaming the um, aisles, and he saw that I was doing that, and he had a million choices to do right then, right? And we know exactly what some people would do and others wouldn't do, and et cetera. And he came and he just put his hand on my shoulder really lightly, and then he kept going. And he just acknowledged that, like, where I was, and those are the types of things, however you translate that into your own community and your own people, are the things I believe that are the best thing to do who's, to someone who's struggling and perhaps do the same thing for yourself. Okay, all right, hold on. Now hands are going up, and I, I just realized it's 10. I know, we're out of time. Okay, we're gonna give the one guy who's put up his hand, and he's gonna promise a short question <laughs> and a short answer. Sure, sure, great, okay, right? I promise, I promise. Speed Q&A, go. Promise. Thank you. Amazing journey. How da I'm David. I think, yeah. I'm David. I, the person who murdered your father. Yes. Do you know much about how his journey or what happened as a result of him going through this dialogue with you? How yeah. he shifted? Yeah. So, um, the offender, I won't share his name because I'd rather you learn like that in the book or, you know, um, um, as I learned him. He's been released from prison. He was released from prison the same couple of months that my book was launched, the same couple of months that my son was born. It was a very intense year 25. And um, he, I share a bit about my perception of him changing, um, but I truly believe that I was the first person out of his immediate environment who offered him a uh, a place of like compassion as well as accountability. Those two things for me like exist together. Um, and I believe that I was part of his journey so that he could be released at 25 years. And now he's like living with a family and doing his thing, I think building things. And um, I'm really happy for him. Not necessarily because I care like so much about him as a human being. I care more about me and the effect of that I want him to be released so I can just move on. Yeah. Sure, sure. Oh, perfect. 